Hello and welcome. In today's presentation, we will take a cursory look at some of the instruments used in quantum computing research and the properties that are most consequential. As a provider of pulse and signal generators for almost 60 years, we are quite proud to provide some of the best technology for today's research in quantum computing. The primary limitation of today's computer is speed, because modern day computers use strings of bits, zeros and ones, to encode data. In processing large amounts of data, such as weather data or large statistical equations, modern computers and even supercomputers are not fast enough to crunch those numbers in acceptable time frames. Consider, for example, that a modern day computer will take about two minutes to decode a 256-bit encryption key. But with a 512-bit key, it will take that same modern computer over a million billion years. So how can we do that 512-bit key encryption in about two weeks? Let me introduce you to the quantum computer. Like modern computers, quantum computers are designed to solve problems. The difference is the way they manipulate data to get answers. One departure from traditional zeros and ones is pro bit processing is the use of new principles of probability. These are principles studied in quantum mechanics like superposition and entanglement. The idea that things are related by probability concepts. The most simple example is a coin flip. While it's in the air, it is both heads and tails with some probability of each. Once it lands and it's observed, it now carries 100% probability of one outcome and 0% of the other. What if we could use the results of the coin flip before it hits the ground? This principle is superposition. Quantum entanglement is a phenomenon in which quantum entities are generated and manipulated such that none of them can be wholly described without referencing the others. A quantum computer leverages entanglement between qubits and the probabilities associated with superpositions to carry out a series of operations known as an algorithm, such that certain probabilities are enhanced and others depressed. Two critical factors making the work in quantum computing so difficult are maintaining qubits in a quantum state and maintaining entanglement between qubits. The better these operations can be carried out, the higher their fidelity. However, balancing the required isolation with the necessary interaction is extremely challenging. This is the IBM Q, an IBM implementation of a quantum computer. Note the various phases, the readout phase on the left, the rack of instrumentation in the middle, and the fridge housing the qubits on the right. The control board and software are shown by the green square. They consist of a classical computer that controls the waveform generators and microwave signal generators. This classical computer can be directly controlled by a user in the cloud or locally. The qubit manipulator and readout rack. The signals produced by the control board through arbitrary waveform generators are mixed with microwave frequencies known as the LOs, before sending them to the fridge. Since quantum coherence is at the heart of quantum technology, the latter can only be realized as long as the quantum coherence is preserved. In fact, as quantum applications increase in complexity, coherence time needs to be extended. In a similar manner, longer coherence times reveal higher performance and higher quantum operation fidelity, which is extremely important, especially for quantum computing. The equipment, the RF signal generators and the ARBs must possess a special characteristic for it to be considered for quantum computing applications. First, let's look at the high bandwidth RF signal generators. Performance priorities include providing a phase stable and phase coherent local oscillator. 
with the ability to maintain phase coherency over extended periods of time. Additional priorities include flexible programming of frequency, power, and phase on each channel with clean adjustments and switching, long-term phase memory, and overall low phase noise. The Berkeley Nucleonics Model 855 offers excellent phase coherence because of several design features. First, each channel has a common, highly stable OCXO frequency reference. The frequencies of all channels are digitally synthesized and derived from the common reference with high resolution. There are homogeneous frequency synthesis circuits for the parallel channels, ensuring maximum phase coherence and inner channel frequency stability. The channels all share the same ambient conditions, which eliminates drift, and each module features a pair of high frequency clock ports, allowing for excellent synchronization between multiple Model 855 units. The Berkeley Nucleonics 855 also offers phase matched outputs. Both channels start at the same frequency and the relative phase between the channels is zero degrees. The peaks match. Then even when we change frequencies at different times, the relative phase of both signals returns to zero degrees when the frequencies are the same. I've asked my colleague Manuel Hagler to elaborate with a short video. In this short animated video, we take a look at the multi-channel signal generator with phase matched outputs. We will give a detailed explanation of what is being shown after we play it through. So here in the beginning, we have both channels running at the same frequency F1. As we can see, the relative phase between the two signals is zero degrees. The peaks of both signals match. Then we switch the frequency of channel A to frequency F2. And shortly after, we follow by switching the frequency of channel B to the same frequency F2. Again, we see that the relative phase between the two signals is zero degrees. One more time, we switch the frequency of channel A to F3, and we follow by switching the frequency of channel B to F3 as well. One more time, we see that the phase uh, between the two signals is zero degrees. This is true whenever we set the channels to the same frequency. They will always have a relative phase of zero degrees. We can see that the phase coherent switching is a necessary condition to achieve phase matched outputs. Now, of course, if we attach cables with different physical characteristics to the outputs of those two channels, their phases would not match. The firmware of our Model 855 supports a command that allows to compensate for mismatching cable length and therefore achieve phase matching independently of the cabling used at the output of the channels. When referring to the switching behavior of a signal, the term phase coherence defines the state of the signal's phase once the switching process is complete. In order to illustrate this, let's consider two phase coherent signals, signal one and signal two at frequency F1 with a relative phase of P1. If signal two is switched to a frequency two and then back to frequency one, the relative phase between the, between the two signals will again be P1. This represents a coherently switched signal. Once again, I've asked Manuel for another video. In this short animation, we will look at two channels of a single unit being phase coherently switched. Let's first play it through and then we will give some explanation about what exactly happens. So, during this first part, both channels run at the same frequency F1. The relative phase is at 0 degrees, the peaks match. 
Then at this moment, uh, we switch both signals to different frequencies. Now we have channel A running at frequency F2 and channel B running at frequency F3. At this stage, the channels are phase co coherently switched, but it is a little hard to see since we set them to some random frequencies F2 and F3. Here, we switch channel A back to frequency F1, and then here, we switch channel B back to frequency F1 as well. We can see that when this happens, the relative phase between the channels is back to zero degrees. In more general terms, when two channels are phase coherently switched, their phase relation is deterministic for all frequencies. In this example, when both channels are set to F1, the relative phase is always zero degrees. If they are both set to frequency F2, their relative phase would be 30 degrees, for instance. This would be true each time they run at frequency F2. A signal is said to have phase memory if, when it is switched from frequency 1 to 2 and then back to frequency 1, the signal's phase resumes at the position it would have had if it had run continuously at frequency F1. In other words, whenever a signal goes back to a previously set frequency, it behaves as if it had been running continuously at that said frequency the whole time. Phase memory usually implies some phase discontinuity. Again, one last video from Manuel to give a better illustration. In this short video, we will look at a single channel unit showing the phase memory behavior of its output being switched between two frequencies. Let's first go through the animation, after which we will have a more detailed look at what we see. So here in the beginning, the signal is running at frequency F1. We then change the frequency to frequency F2 and show with the blue dotted trace how the signal would look like if it had remained at frequency F1. Here it is hard to tell if there is any particular relationship between the two traces. We then switch the signal back to frequency F1 and we can see that the signal matches the imaginary dotted trace. The signal behaves as if it had been running at frequency F1 the whole time. In other words, if we measure the phase of the signal at a time T0, we know exactly what phase the signal will have at time T1 if at both times T, T0 and T1, the signal is set to the same frequency. In the time in between T0 and T1, we can change the frequency of the signal as much as we like. A waveform generator is used to translate user data. It must be flexible and capable of producing analog or digital signals and building complex RF, IF, or IQ waveforms based on a serial data stream provided by the user. As mentioned earlier, both the local oscillator and the ARB are critical equipment for quantum computing and phase coherency on all channels is an absolute requirement. The latest Berkeley Nucleonics ARB, the Model 685, offers performance features well suited for quantum computing applications. Most notably, this unit is the only ARB available with a high output amplitude, 5 volts, at the speed and bandwidth offered. Typical units at 6 giga samples per second, 16 bits, are often limited to 1 volt. Recently, IBM and Google launched their new 50-bit qubit systems. However, quantum computing still has many challenges to overcome. Current quantum systems are incredibly complex and challenging to use. Each qubit requires some number of precisely timed and sequenced RF pulse control signals. Researchers need very precise signal sources with high fidelity to generate complex pulse sequences and accordingly evaluate the behavior of the qubits. Using a high performance arbitrary waveform generator is the right choice to save time and allow research to iterate quickly through automated test setups and different waveforms. For this application, our model 685 is well suited by offering the world's fastest 16-bit performance. 
the Model 685 Arbitrary Waveform Generator also offers unmatched signal fidelity coupled with a 6.16 gigasample per second sampling rate and up to four gigasamples of waveform memory per channel. Even better, unlike the arbitrary waveform generators available that max out at one volt peak to peak, we offer five volts peak to peak analog output amplitude, giving you the industry's best signal stimulus solution. The typical quantum system needs two to three arbitrary waveform generator channels for proper control of each qubit, and the synchronization between the pulse sequences is a key point for the success of the algorithms and tests. The BNC Model 685 offers eight highly synchronized channels and a scaling multi-instrument feature that allows you to control and synchronize up to four units to build a system made of 32 analog channels and 128 digital channels, perfectly integrated with our TrueArb software. The RMS jitter is extremely low, typically below four picoseconds. The analog channel to channel skew resolution is less than 100 femtoseconds. And you can adjust the skew, not only between the analog channels, but also between analog channels and marker out or digital channels. The, Ber the Berkeley Nucleonics 685 Arbitrary Waveform Generator standard software package contains the waveform editor that allows you to create different pulse shapes and pulse structures quickly. You won't spend hours on programming waveforms. The waveform editor is a graphical and intuitive tool that can be used to save time and increase the speed of your experiments. The pulse waveforms can be inserted into the TrueArb sequencer to create complex pulse sequences quickly. Additionally, the advanced mode allows you to insert conditional or unconditional jump and wait instructions to change dynamically the execution of the pulse sequences. Han Echo sequence, Carr, Purcell, Mayboom sequence, and Urig dynamical decoupling are only a few of the pulse sequences that can be created with the model 685 software package and they can be used in dynamical decoupling correction of inhomogeneous microwave fields or quantum error correction experiments phase coherent switching and phase memory can also be obtained easily using the waveform editor or a third-party tool like labview or MATLAB, which create the waveform points in a dot text format that can be directly imported into the TrueArb software. The Berkeley Nucleonics 685 is the world's fastest 16-bit arbitrary waveform generator, offering 6.16 gigasamples per second update rates and 16-bit vertical resolution performance. I know we've said this already, but this is important. We also offer two gigahertz bandwidth and up to five volts peak to peak output and up to four gigasamples of memory depth. This combination of performance metrics make the Berkeley Nucleonics 685 the ideal choice for quantum computing, quantum sensing, or quantum communication applications. Furthermore, you won't need to compromise on analog performance. The fast rise time of 110 picoseconds can be achieved at the maximum amplitude of five volts peak to peak. The Berkeley Nucleonics 685 also offers up to 32 digital channels as an option. Combining with two, four, or eight analog channels, this makes the 685 a full featured mixed signal generator. The quantum computing applications we are addressing today will lead to the next technological breakthroughs, helping to solve optimization problems in dozens of fields. Fields such as logistics, aerodynamics, medical and cancer studies, new algorithms and machine learning, artificial intelligence, or database searching. Quantum technology involves much more than superconducting qubits. Research is also focused on other elements, such as trapped ions, optical cavities, photonic structures, 
nuclear spins, and mechanical resonators. Each of these research areas presents its own challenges and requires specific test signals characterized by different amplitudes and speeds. Complex parallel computations which allow quantum simulations will be fundamental for the development of the pharma industry or the simulations of new materials. Cancer detection, mining, precise navigation systems, anti-self quantum radar, and microscopy are some of the quantum sensing applications that can be addressed by the quantum technology. The Model 685 Arbitrary Waveform Generator is flexible enough to fit into almost any automated test environment. We offer a full set of Skippy commands that allow the user to use the instrument in remote modes and easily add it to any automated test environment. The instrument is fully compatible with LAN, GPIB, or USB TMC interfaces. Programming examples in LabVIEW speed up the integration time and add your ARB to LabVIEW's powerful graphical programming environment. You can also take full advantage of the visualization and programming capabilities found in MATLAB or the flexibility offered by Python or the .NET programming languages. A solution that combines an RF signal generator with an arbitrary waveform generator is called a vector signal generator. It simplifies the electronics needed to convert user data to a modulated RF signal that can be transmitted to the fridge. The Berkeley Nucleonics Model 875 Vector Signal Generator offers frequencies up to 40 gigahertz with full digital IQ modulation and 400 megahertz bandwidth, ultra-fast frequency sweeping, chirping, intrapulse modulation, and pulse shaping all with ultra low phase noise. The RAM can be pre-configured and triggered as needed to provide the exact waveforms required. For an external interface, we now offer our new FCP port, fast control port, which live streams digital IQ data up to 250 millisamples per, per second. We have been talking about instruments that are typically in the qubit manipulation stage. They are often in a rack alongside the system. In order to understand where cryogenic LNAs are used, we need to understand where they fit into a quantum computer. Here on the screen is a typical functional block diagram of a quantum computer consisting of the control board and software, the qubit manipulator, the fridge, the qubit readout. The qubit manipulator and readout are actually in the same racks as they share components like phase coherent signal generators, often used as local oscillators. Here you can see a rack of in instrumentation in the background and then the fridge housing the qubits in the front. This is a working quantum computer. The qubit fridge is the key in achieving a quantum state. The fridge is cooled down to near absolute zero, approximately 15 millikelvin. The signal is transmitted through resonator circuits that induce a qubit state dependent phase shift. The signal is then amplified by the Josephson parametric amplifier, JPA. Isolators are used to prevent noise from interfering with the signal. It is then further amplified by cryogenic low noise amplifiers before being transmitted to the qubit readout circuit. The greatest hurdles at the moment are that even the state of the art cryogenic semiconductor amplifiers still have approximately four times too much noise for quantum applications, thus making it difficult to distinguish between qubit states. One way to combat this is to characterize the noise temperature of the LNA, which we will discuss later. From the fridge, the signal goes to the qubit readout block, where signals are mixed down to a frequency that can be digitized before a classical computer displays the results as zeros and ones.
Here, finally, we see the control board and software displaying results to the end user. Focusing on more details in a typical qubit readout receiver array, you see that the basic operation of the readout circuit starts with signals that are injected into a parametric amplifier circuit at a harmonic multiple of the qubit resonance state. This produces a homodyne mixing effect that produces gain when the injected signal and qubit signal are in phase. Very low power signals need to be injected to prevent the overwriting of the quantum state of the qubit. Therefore, the signal at the output of the parametric amplifier is very weak and needs to be amplified. This amplification is achieved with a cryo LNA, which typically has noise temperatures of 2 to 5 Kelvin. After cryogenic amplification, the signal goes through a conventional RF receiver at room temperature, and the state can be read from an analog to digital converter. To dig a little deeper into the benefits of cryogenic low noise amplifiers. I've asked my colleague Michael Himmelfarb to provide a, a few slides as an overview. Take it away, Mike. Hello. Cryogenically cooled amplifiers are becoming an important R&D topic to a large degree due to quantum computing. There are many parts that come into making a quantum computer. Cryogenically cooled amplifiers is one of these parts that we'll focus on here, describe the reasons for their use and ways of verifying their noise performance. Cryogenic low noise amplifiers present a unique subset of radio frequency amplifier technology. They were initially created for radio astronomy and space ex exploration applications, but they are now used in many other fields such as particle accelerators, nuclear magnetic resonance systems, and quantum computers. For a qubit in a superposition of state of 0 and 1, readout outputs corresponds to the probabilities of basis 0 and basis 1. As a result, often multiple readout circuits, as shown in the previous slide, are needed to read a single qubit with a high level of confidence. Up to 1,000 receivers for a single qubit are needed depending on the level of confidence required. The more readout circuits for a single bit, the higher the confidence of the qubit state. Additionally, the less noise added by the readout circuits results and fewer receivers for the same level of confidence. For example, a plasma on qubit level corresponds to different energy levels. The difference between the two levels corresponds to a 5 gigahertz photon with 20 microelectron volts of energy. This is a very low level of energy. To read such a qubit, a readout circuit transmits only about minus 125 dBm or 0.3 femtowatts of peak power, which interacts with the qubit resonator circuit and is reflected for reading by the readout circuit. Because the input power is so low, the readout circuit has to be very sensitive. In fact, in terms of noise temperatures, the readout circuit should have a noise temperature of approximately 0.56 Kelvin or better. Noise temperature indicates the equivalent noise power contributed by the readout circuit to the output of the qubit. The addition of noise spreads the qubit probability into potentially incorrect states. This spread can be seen as the overlap of the signal space states in the diagram on this slide. Therefore, it is desirable to introduce the least noise possible to a qubit measurement because it reduces the amount of hardware required to compute the probability. When we cool LNAs to cryogenic temperatures, they generate less noise and maintain a high signal to noise ratio, or SNR. To quantify the reduction of SNR due to an amplifier, the concept of noise factor is used. Noise temperature discussed in the previous slide and a well-known noise figure relate directly to the noise factor. Note that the required 0.56 Kelvin of noise temperature corresponds to 8 milliDB of noise figure. For those who design conventional room temperature LNAs, these type of noise figures are unheard of, with the typical commercial receiver noise temperature being well over 300 Kelvin or noise figures of 3 dB. Clearly, when we design cryogenic LNAs, we need means of measuring the noise temperature uh, and being able to optimize them so that the lowest noise temperature possible is achieved. Measuring of cryogenic noise temperatures is possible, but the noise temperatures have limitations of only being applicable in a perfectly matched network and not being able to provide a path for optimization. 
better ways to measure noise parameters of cryogenic LNAs. Noise parameters consist of the minimum noise factor or minimum noise temperature, F min, complex optimal admittance or impedance for minimum noise, Y opt, that consists of the real part, G opt, and the imaginary part, B opt, and the equivalent noise resistance, Rn. When noise parameters are known, the noise factor is known, and the impact of the signal source on the noise factor is also known. The equation on this, on this slide demonstrates the relationship between the noise factor and the noise parameters. The signal source admittance, admittance is denoted as YS on this slide. The Smith chart shows an illustration of the information that noise parameters provide. The small red circle that looks like a dot identifies the source admittance that makes noise factor reach its minimum value. The red circles show contours of constant noise factor as functions of the source admittance. By inspection of the Smith chart, we can tell how to match the input of LNA, any LNA. Because of the information captured by the noise parameters, they are well known and often used. For example, most amplifier and transistor data sheets specify noise parameters for typical operating conditions. All industry standard software packages, for example, Key Sites ADS, National Instruments Microwave Office, and Cadence's Spectre, accept noise parameter data and are able to use them properly. All industry standard software packages can also simulate and output noise parameters of user circuits and create no noise circles as shown on this slide. In summary, noise parameters provide the following benefits. They provide the complete picture of the best noise figure possible with a given device, typically a low noise amplifier. They give designers all necessary information on how to design a matching network to achieve the lowest noise figure. They provide ways of comparing devices in terms of their noise ease of matching, and sensitivity to mismatch. They predict how much noise temperature penalty to expect due to mismatches of the LNA input. These mismatches arise due to antennas not being exactly 50 ohms when an LNA is connected to an antenna, or in a quantum computer when the output impedance of the network following the Josephson parametric amplifier is not exactly 50 ohms. Noise parameters allow proper calculation of noise figure for cascaded of system components. They also permit evaluation of the quality of the input matching network and the ability to achieve the best noise figure, ease the trade-off between the power consumption and noise figure. As discussed on the previous slide, the input admittance to an amplifier can impact the noise factor of the amplifier itself, and an optimal exists. Once the noise parameters are measured and the optimal, optimal admittance is known, the designer can apply the optimal matching to the stage in front of the low noise amplifier, as shown on this slide. Due to Freeze cascaded noise equation, the first amplifier of a receiver chain sets the noise floor of the system, given it has sufficient gain. Therefore, it is desirable to optimize the first stage by measuring its noise parameters. In this case, the first stage is a parametric amplifier. Parametric amplifiers are a little different from truly linear devices such as LNAs. In reality, parametric amplifiers behave more like a mixer, and noise can contribute from multiple image frequencies. As long as the injected frequency, or LO, is similar in frequency to the input frequency, qubit resonance, then fundamental image frequencies will be similar and can be modeled accurately with noise parameters. To find the four unknown noise parameters, we need at least four measurements at each frequency a way of creating four measurements is by modifying the source admittance and measuring the noise factors. These give us a way to find the unknown noise parameters that are highlighted in the red equations on this slide. For cryogenic LNAs, these measurements have to be performed at cryogenic temperatures. Because noise power levels are very low, many averages are required to minimize the measurement uncertainty. The challenge is in creating at least four different admittances while consuming low power, so, so to avoid heating the cryostat, and also occupying low volume so that the cryostat size can remain compact. It turns out that there are four optimal regions for locating source admittances. The Smith chart shows these regions A, B, C, and D. By locating four admittances so that one is located within each of the four regions, Linear algebra tells us that the noise parameters can be solved. If we can also make these admittances remain within the four regions over the required frequency range, then we can reduce the number of measurements to just four. 
This simplifies the network that generates such impedances, making it smaller and less power hungry compared to conventional room temperature noise parameter measurement systems. There are different methods of measuring cryogenic noise parameters. Assuming that the noise parameter measurement equipment is available, the most straightforward way is to, is to use it by connecting the cryo LNA to the equipment with stainless steel coaxial cables as shown in the left figure. The stainless steel cables are used to minimize the thermal loading of the room temperature environment on the cryostat and the LNA. Unfortunately, these cables are not at thermal equilibrium because their two ends are at two very different physical temperatures. This results in large measurement errors, mainly due to the input cables themselves. Another method is by using the long line method. This avoids the input stainless steel coaxial cables, but requires more volume inside the cryostat. The lengths of the long lines depends on the frequency and can become very long if lower frequencies need to be measured. The preferred method is by placing the impedance generator inside the cryostat itself. If the impedance generator is only required to generate four different impedance states as previously discussed, the impedance generator can be very compact and low power. This method can have two variants. It can use a cooled termination method or a cold attenuator method for measuring the noise factors. Both met methods are well known and often used for noise factor measurements. These methods minimize the effect of the input stainless steel coaxial cable on the accuracy of the measurement. A photo of a typical measurement setup is shown to the right. Both LNA and penance generators are mounted to the cold head. That is possible because of their compact size. This slide shows an example of a cryo LNA measurement conducted by Alex Sheldon at the University of Calgary. This LNA was developed at Arizona State University for use in radio astronomy. The measurements show that Y opt of the LNA diverges away from the center of the Smith chart, indicating that some additional optimization of the LNA performance is possible to reduce its noise temperature even further as opposed to an unoptimized design. Some of the noise parameters from the previous slide are shown here again. The right side of the slide shows the optimal admittance measured at room temperature, the blue curve, and at 20 Kelvin with the black curve. It is very noticeable that the black curve is further from the center of the Smith chart. This indicates that noise matching is affected by cooling. When driven by a 50 ohm signal source, this LNA would experience approximately 2 Kelvin of additional noise penalty as indicated by the differences of the gray curve, the LNA noise temperature, and the black curve, the LNA noise minimum noise temperature on the left side. For applications such as quantum computing or radio astronomy, two Kelvin difference is often very significant. And in this example corresponds to more than 20% of the increase in noise temperature over what is actually possible. Without noise parameters, it would be impossible to know whether a measured noise temperature can be improved by redesigning the LNA matching or whether it is the best the LNA can achieve. In summary, there are many applications in which the sensitivity of a receiver determines performance and competitiveness of the system. It is not possible to optimize the sensitivity of a receiver without knowing the amplifier's noise parameters. Designers do their best work when they have access to the full slate of circuit performance metrics. In the case of receivers, the noise parameters are what a designer would need to make sure the receiver's design achieve the best sensitivity possible. Great. Uh, thanks, Mike. And to wrap up now, let me just reiterate, we have this broad family of products that provide ultra high performance and some unique features uh, to address the various uh, stages in your quantum computing application. Thank you again for your time reviewing this presentation. Uh, here's another picture of that beautiful IBM quantum computer. And uh, of course, if you have questions, we're available from 6 to 6, Monday through Friday, and available online at our engineer chat or by email or telephone. And we'd love to work with you directly on your specific application. Uh, hope to hear from you soon.